So let's get started here. All set? Yeah. Okay. So uh, welcome, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about the SIG architecture and the sub-projects of SIG architecture uh, a little bit. So how many of you have written code and submitted a PR in any of the Kubernetes repositories? Okay. So did all the bots attack you? <laughs> so uh, we have plenty of stuff going on. Um, just submitting a PR is one of the things that you know, we do. And, but there is a lot of processes behind the scenes, so we'll go through some of the things that we do uh, as a project. So to introduce ourselves, uh, I'm, I go by Dims. That's my nickname. My full name is Dhanam Srinivas, and I work for VMware. My handle on GitHub and Twitter is at Dims. Do you want to? I'm Jordan Liggett. I work for Google, and I'm Liggett everywhere. OK. So let's, before we start, let's go over some of the community values that kind of drive us. So uh, we like to distribute the work. We don't want you know, people to get overloaded and stuff like that, right? So, and we value community o over a specific product or a company. And we try to automate everything that we do. Um, so that's part of the reason why you have so many bots that come come by your way when you, when you try to interact with us. Um, and we always, we try to listen to all the things that you're saying. Sometimes it's hard, sometimes maybe you feel that you know, they're not listening to us, but uh, we do try to, uh, you know, whether it is on Twitter or Slack or on issues and PRs, we do try to pay attention. But there's things that we can do, there's things that we can't do, uh, but there's context involved and there is history involved and things like that. But overall, we do try to tweak things that we do, and we try to evolve uh, and not uh, let things be the same way over time. So just to, uh, for all the people who haven't dealt with the hierarchy and structure uh, that we have at Kubernetes, so we have the CNCF on top, and then we have Kubernetes is a project under CNCF. So in in Kubernetes, the main uh, you know, uh, overlap between CNCF and Kubernetes is the steering committee. And under the steering committee, we have all the uh, special interest groups. Uh, anybody, know, uh, anybody not know what a special interest group is? So everybody knows, I guess. So we have special interest group for uh, various areas like storage or node and things like that, architecture and things like that. And uh, we have work groups, uh, jump in anytime. Uh, we have work groups and we have user groups as well. So this is as of a month ago, I, I think. I don't think we've added anything since then. <laughs> so uh, was this yours? Just yep. uh, mine. OK, so we have a set of design principles, uh, and we, but you know, some of the things is like we don't have the same set of people working on the code over a period of time. Uh, so we try to write down what we can. So we have, so people who come later can rely on some written material to see what happened, why was a decision taken, and things like that. So. We try to write down API conventions. We try to write down conformance test information, uh, you know, uh, the architecture, design principles, and a deprecation policy. So somebody, somebody coming in and say, oh, this CLI flag is no longer useful. When can I deprecate it? So we don't want to restart a whole another discussion uh, when we get a new, uh, new request like that from somebody saying, OK, this is not useful anymore. Let's try to get rid of it. So we don't want to say, uh, so we have written down, uh, you know, if it's a CLI flag, how do we deal with it? If it's an API change, how do we deal with it? So uh, that's basically what the Sigarch does. Uh, Sigarch tries to do stuff which is across all the SIGs, and um, we try to maintain some consistency and try to make sure that people can um, you know, go look for information and they can help themselves instead of having to 
ask someone or go to a meeting and we all end up talking about the same thing all over again and again and with different answers in, at different times. Okay. So if you look at that uh, project diagram, you know, there's a lot of work going on in lots of little boxes and they have their view of the world, uh, whether they're focused on you know, containers or the node or scheduling or windows or security or wh whatever it is. Uh, and the goal of SIG architecture is to take the things that we want to be consistent um, across those both just in terms of best practices, like we realized after years and years, this works best, let's not have to relearn the same lesson over and over. Uh, and also in terms of uh, consistency for users. You know, people using Kubernetes don't really care which little box a particular thing came out of. They want to use the whole project as a coherent thing. Uh, and so these are the main cross-cutting processes uh, where SIG architecture tries to document and provide uh, information and tooling and uh, just a, a place for all of those individual areas to um, learn and follow the best practices. And so uh, conformance, we'll go over these in more detail, but uh, the conformance testing uh, ensures a consistent surface so that if you are running on Kubernetes in one cloud or another cloud or on-premise or wherever it is, uh, there's a certain set of things you can assume exist and function a specific way. Uh, the API review process, uh, again, is documenting conventions and, and things that make sure the API surface is as coherent as we can make it and gives a document for people writing APIs and designing APIs so that they don't have to have one-on-one -on -one consultation sessions. They can start with sort of these foundational principles. Um, design document and management, there's a, a repository full of design documents in various stages, and so sort of the process around that the, the questions that you need to answer in a design document, uh, that's overseen by uh, SIG architecture. And then finally, Dim's talked about the, the deprecation policy, SKU policies. Uh, and this is, again, to help the people building Kubernetes understand you know, what am I allowed to do? How long do I have to keep these two things working together over what span of time? And then also, from the perspective of people deploying Kubernetes clusters. You know, how do I go about upgrading? What order do I have to do things in? What does the project test and guarantee? And then finally, from a user's perspective, uh, documenting that, making sure that everybody understands that and is on the same page. Oh, while we are going through this, if you have any question on anything that we are saying, just stop us because otherwise it's not gonna help you later. Yeah, we will, we will try to leave some time at the end, but yeah, but yeah for sure. Free to, Jump in, that's fine as well. Um, other things that come up in SIG architecture, uh, we have patterns, sometimes they apply really clearly in all those various areas, sometimes new things come up, right? We're solving a lot of problems and sometimes there are problems we really haven't thought through before. And so SIG architecture is a place uh, to come and discuss those. And there are a lot of people with a lot of experience. Um, it's a helpful place to kind of collaborate across uh, SIGs and across working groups. Um, if there's inconsistencies, we're doing A here and B here, which should it be, should it be C? Uh, those are the types of questions that people will start on the mailing lists or, or in the SIG architecture meetings. Um, it doesn't happen a lot, but sometimes the people leading different subprojects disagree about what the right thing is. It's not a question of what should we do, it's like I definitely know we should do A and I definitely know we should do B. And so again, those tend to kind of bubble up and get broader perspectives uh, in SIG Arch. And so the, the normal way that we start those discussions is with a mailing list. Uh, we try to work asynchronously as much as we can. Uh, there are a lot of people across a lot of SIGs. The more cross-cutting you get, the more expensive those meetings become. And so uh, we like to start things as mailing list threads and try to iron out discussions there as much as possible. Um, if there are designs or issues, referencing those so that people who aren't necessarily uh, available or awake <laughs> at a particular time when a meeting is held can still participate in those discussions and follow along. And so if you're interested, even just subscribing to the mailing list is uh, a pretty good way to at least see some of these discussions as they're happening so you can follow along. All right, so we're gonna jump through these sub-projects. Um, I think we already talked through this, uh, so I'll talk through the first one. So diving down into the API review process, uh, there's a short link there. You can read through it. Uh, 
there are kind of two categories of APIs, ones that are built into Kubernetes and then ones that are built on top of Kubernetes using custom resources or, or other extension mechanisms. Uh, the ones built into Kubernetes have to go through API review, and uh, right now those consume the majority of the bandwidth of the, the reviewers, but uh, over the past couple of releases, we've been working to distribute expertise in this area so that all of those individual areas have people identified as being familiar with these who can do first passes on designs and reviews. Um, and so we're, we're working to spin up capacity in that area. If you're working in an area that doesn't have API reviewers and you would like to get familiar with these and sort of be able to provide that to that area, uh, that would be great. Come talk to me afterwards and uh, I'll point you in the right direction. Yeah. Um. So you can see the spaghetti in there. So that's some of the inputs that we have. And so over a period of time, um, you know, we've added to the complexity of what we have. And we have a mono repo. Kubernetes Kubernetes is a single repository, which has a lot of things. So uh, we have a sub project called um, Code Organization, where we look at what are the things that we vendor, um, as in pull stuff that we use from like Docker Docker or uh, Microsoft HC Shim or Gopher Cloud, all those things are vendor dependencies. So we have a lot of them, uh, especially because we have uh, cloud providers. So when we add a new cloud provider, we end up pulling a whole bunch of additional dependencies. So. We've accumulated this over time. So uh, the code organization project is about how do we make things simpler, easier, um, both for the building as well as the release, uh, and trying to, we don't want really stale dependencies. So if there is an external repository that we are vendoring in, and uh, if the CV gets fixed there, we won't even know about it because you know, half the time we are using a SHA instead of a release. So we've gone through this process of, okay, let's look deeply into our vendor dependencies. Uh, what is in there? Do we really need it? Uh, are there alternatives? Can we switch to something else? Uh, can we switch to something better? Can we switch to a specific version? So when a new version comes in, we can do a diff between the old and the new so we can pull in the new version. And sometimes the transitive dependencies uh, cause problems. Like um, I'll tell you the example from two days ago. Um, the Azure folks uh, wanted to update something. Uh, and what en ended up happening was the container D version that they were pulling in through their dependency was not matching the container, uh, the dependency that was pulling in through C advisor. So, C Advisor needs container D, and then the Azure needs container D, and those were not matching. So then we have to jump in and say, okay, this is what you gotta do. You gotta first take the container D, which is the newer SHA, newer version, add it to C Advisor, and then update both what you need uh, and what um, you know, C Advisor needs. So you end up fixing three dependencies instead of just the thing that the Azure team wanted. So that's another example um, of uh, code organization stuff. And this is like ongoing basis. And the other thing we do is like uh, we, we have patterns uh, about code uh, itself, right? Um, in terms of, so how to put this? So we need to get rid of code from KK. So one mechanism that we use is called the staging mechanism where we move some of the code into a staging directory, and that staging directory gets published into separate repositories, so it can be consumed easily by anybody. Um, so we have a bot that pulls, uh, say, API missionary stuff and publishes in a separate repository. So when you're writing code against KK, you can just use, um, you know, KSIO slash API missionary. So Nikita here is uh, owning the bot that does that work. So uh, you know. Uh, so uh, that is one example. So the other example is we move code from uh, KK into uh, an external repository. For one example would be Kubernetes Utils. So Kubernetes Utils is a repository where we have some utility function, but 
we think that those utility functions are usable outside of the Kubernetes ecosystem. So uh, we have a process for doing that. So when somebody says, okay, I need to extract this code, then we go through this mechanism of, okay, should it go under staging? Should it go into a separate repository? You know, what do we do? Do we just put it in another repository maintained by another organization and then we just went in? So we go through this mechanism of, okay, what is the best way to do this? So it, we can take care of this code in the longer term. So that's basically what we do in code organization. And uh, there's a lot more people in this room who know more about conformance testing than me. John is here, and you know Brad has been involved uh, for a long time as as well. So the effort here is uh, you as a consumer, you go to um, one of the cloud providers and say, "I want to use your, the Kubernetes that you're providing." So and then you go take your YAMLs and you run the stuff, and then you see there are maybe subtle changes here and there. And like we want to reduce that kind of thing uh, where you struggle moving uh, stuff from one cloud provider to another cloud provider. So that's where the conformance stuff comes in. Uh, we try to make sure that there is, uh, there is guarantees that you can rely on uh, when you're writing your applications so uh, you don't have to run into trouble um, you know, getting stuff from one place to another place. So uh, that would be one of the main things about the conformance project. And this would be, uh, here we have a collaboration with CNCF because the, the way this works is, first we write tests, and then we evaluate whether the tests uh, are you know, valid conformance tests. Uh, and we have a set of criteria for something uh, to be a conformance test. And then we go through that process of uh, saying, yes, this is a good conformance test, we should promote it. Then we add a tag, so, and then what ha ends up happening is it, it gets run as part of our CI job, and it runs against multiple cloud providers, and then we kind of like, okay, this, this seems to stick, so we are, we are good, and then we make a release. And then the end-to-end -end tests end up going to tools like Sonoboy, uh, and then gets used by everybody in the community. So that, if you run Sonoboy, you are essentially running the end-to-end -end tests which are in our repository, uh, essentially. So, uh, and then we have some guarantees around um, you know, how and when you can run which versions of the conformance tests against which versions of the release code and things like that as well. So that's basically the overall view about the uh, conformance tests. And show them the visualization. Sorry? Yeah, sorry. So we, and we have additional tools like uh, API Snoop, uh, uh, and I think there's at least one person from II so, who takes care of the API Snoop tool. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the API Snoop? Uh, oh, sure. How it helps with the stable? And, uh, yeah, so this is a tool that's designed to help us see where we have coverage gaps. Uh, so it takes the output of running conformance tests, running an E2E -E test, and basically identifies all the endpoints we have, all the operations on those endpoints, and then tells us how we're doing. Like, in this case, this particular API group is doing really well, uh, but if you kind of look at the faded areas, there are others that aren't quite so covered. Uh, and so this is what we're working to close, these gaps, um, so that uh, we know that a conformant cluster actually supports all of these operations, and those do what you think they're supposed to do, and the changes make things happen the way you think they should. Uh, so if you're interested in helping, there's a lot of work to do here. Uh, it's pretty uh, straightforward and well documented, like what should be done. There's just a lot to do. Right. So. Uh, the other angle here is we are trying another tactic as well. John is driving this, uh, which is about trying to define something in text, right? And then start from text to say somebody who's knowledgeable in the area will write a text file which says, this is what we expe expect from the text, uh, from the test. And then we, we are trying to see if we can have some code generator which will turn around and turn that into an actual test. This is extremely preliminary at this point, uh, but the, the thought here is we would ping the SIG leads and uh, technical leads of various SIGs to actually contribute to this description, right? Typically what happens is when you go look at our end-to-end -end test, Sometimes you don't even know what the test is doing. So if you start from a description, then it might be easier over a period of time to do this. That, so that is another uh, area that we are investigating. 
Um, an area that just started up, uh, we're calling production readiness. Uh, this kind of came out of experience or feedback from cluster operators that some of the features we were releasing uh, were difficult to run uh, for various reasons. Sometimes it was a documentation issue. Sometimes it was uh, the inability to monitor at scale uh, via metrics and sort of programmatic observation. Uh, sometimes it was a lack of a particular type of testing, soap testing, scale testing, uh, whatever it was. There is a variety of things feeding into this, but uh, the goal of this subproject is really to answer the question, um, how will people run this in production? And start to make that part of the design process so that the people writing designs who are very focused and know their area really well uh, understand the types of questions that the people who are going to be using their features are asking and what they need to make really clear and make sure is available. Metrics, monitoring, scale testing, soak testing, documentation, like all of these aspects uh, need to get baked into our design process. So this is trying to organize that both with feedback from people running uh, clusters, running clusters at scale, running clusters in lots of different environments, uh, and then from the people writing the designs. Like, how can we guide those to gather the right information? Right. So this one happens during the CAP process itself. Um, so if we are trying to front load it, rather than go and talk to people after they have written the code. So uh, it, it, that's, you know, that's important as well, because some, when people are writing the code, they don't, sometimes they don't know how uh, the end users are going to be using it as well. Okay, so uh, there are three other things that we are trying to do. Uh, this is absolutely nascent. Uh, the first one that we are trying to do is call, uh, that is what we are calling technical debt. And what happens is um, sometimes we take shortcuts, um, and people have taken shortcuts over the past. So, uh, and there are to-dos and fix-me's in the code. There are issues and PRs, uh, you know, some PRs that were closed by the bot because there was, you know, somebody tried to do a good job and then, you know, they couldn't take it through the whole process and then the bot closed the PR. So we are trying to, and there are lots of issues where there's like thumbs up on, from multiple people saying, yes, we need to do this, but, you know, uh, we haven't done it yet uh, because of various reasons. Uh, so, we, but then, also, over a period of time, the people who were uh, trying to track these kinds of things in their head are no longer with us uh, in the sense that you know, they've moved on to other projects and you know, they're doing other things. So we, this is like a discovery process phase right now, going back in, uh, to the PRs and issues and caps and enhan en enhancements uh, and going through the code to figure out what is it that we have missed um, and Based on, uh, so we are trying, trying to collect the data. We also uh, are thinking about um, going and interviewing uh, the people that, like Joe or you know, other people who have been in the project, Tim Hawken, uh, have been in the project for a long time to say, why did you do this? <laughs> How can we fix this? What do we have to do? So uh, we, this would be like a really good way of uh, going back in history and trying to figure out how things were done, why, what is the, uh, maybe we have learned things or, along the way where, you know, the older decisions are no, long, are no longer valid. So maybe we, it's time for us to, you know, move on and do something else. So this is basically the technical debt team. Uh, there's three, four of us. Uh, we, in the contributor summit yesterday, uh, what was it yesterday? Yes, yesterday, uh, three more people said they were interested. So this is like a smaller group. Uh, and Mayank here is leading the group. So if you're interested in this kind of research work where you, know, you get, to, get to talk to a lot of knowledgeable people and try to understand what, what has been happening in the project, uh, this will be like a good fit for you, for you to uh, come in and help us out. Uh, you learn a lot. Um, you know. Why do we use conditions? Do we, should we use conditions? Like, you know, there's so much that you can learn from, uh, from doing this research. It's, it's, it's an amazing opportunity for sure. So, and Mayank is doing this. So the other one we are doing is the, the book club. We are starting a book club where we are getting people to read the caps, right? Uh, what has been happening is, you know, people who are interested will gather on a cap and say yay, nay, and then 
they move on. But then what's happening is, uh, you know, they, we need to get more people involved in the care process um, so that we are doing a, again, it goes back to the front loading issue where we make sure that things are done right the first time around. So uh, Tim Hawken is running this, so, you know, and there's a few other people who, uh, David Yeds uh, signed up for it. So, uh, you know, if you're interested in understanding what we are doing and what we are going to do next uh, in the next, re next upcoming releases, this is the best way to get involved. Uh, this gives you a head up, heads up on the features that are going to come in, gives you a heads up on you know, what are the trade-offs. If something gets deprecated, something gets changed, uh, you will get a, a really early view on this. And we would love to, uh, especially operators, uh, to get involved here. And part of the goal of that is to um, make sure that things don't slip through the cracks. So Correct. these, the, the people who are working on reading through these, the goal is for them to read it, discuss it, think about it, and then kind of bring back a summary or a report back to the main SIG architecture meeting. Uh, so if you are going to those or listening to the recordings of those, you will get sort of the distilled, here's the point of this, and here's the good things and the bad things and the questions. And um, so the, the goal is to fold that back into the main meeting and kind of make good use of that time uh, so we're not um, all reading it during the meeting, but have already read it and thought about it and bring back distilled feedback. Right. I, typically, what used to happen was you know, the kept writer would come and say, this is what I did. And then people will go back and read afterwards. So you're trying to do, switch it around so that it gets done earlier. Don't get, don't get me wrong. We love speaking <laughs> without having made like, informed opinions. <laughs> but sometimes we do it the right way and think right. through it before we speak. Right. Uh, and we always could use uh, help with uh, issues and PR triage. And yeah. this is extremely low volume. It takes about 10, 15 minutes every week. Um, this is a good way to figure out Somebody tagged SIG architecture. Why did they tag SIG architecture? Does it really need to be tagged with SIG architecture? Can SIG node and SIG storage can talk between the two of them? And do we really need SIG, SIG architecture? So, and then you push things around uh, to the correct bucket and to the correct SIG. That's basically what we do here in the uh, issue PR triage. The other thing that happens here is to make sure that if there are really burning issues, then we add it to the meeting agenda. So that's the additional thing that we'll end up doing in this. Um, currently, we don't have anybody doing this. We just do it on an ad hoc basis. But I would rather if, um, you know, if we do it on a weekly basis or every other week uh, for you know, 10 minutes. So it doesn't take that long. Yeah. Um, if you're just talking about the KK, we have thousands of issues. Uh, if you're talking about just the SIG architecture, there are not that many issues or PRs coming in. So that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. Just so you know, KK is Kubernetes. Kubernetes, Kubernetes, Kubernetes. sorry. It's the main repository and the main GitHub org. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> um, so real quick, I want to make sure we get to the last slide. Um, where are we going? In the last release, our extension mechanisms, custom resources, admission webhooks uh, got promoted to GA. And so for most things, the first response to requests to add things to the project is going to be try it out as an extension, build it on top, prove it out, do a prototype, uh, explore the solution you're looking at um, on top, rather than starting everything sort of in tree and pushing it out to everybody consuming Kubernetes. Uh, and the hope is that that will uh, sort of slim down the velocity and rate of change in the core of Kubernetes and let us work on paying down some of this technical debt, do some cleanup work, do some stabilization, uh, and sort of enable people to still get features that they want uh, without uh, burdening them, uh, burdening the whole community on sort of niche features by building it in directly into Kubernetes. Um, and with all that extra time that we get, uh, we are working on building out conformance stuff, working on the reliability, the production readiness reviews, making our designs and our existing features higher quality. All right. So if all this sounds fascinating to you, how can you participate? Uh, the link there lists about eight different ways you can get in touch. There's Slack, there's mailing lists, there's meetings. Um, it breaks out the sub-projects that we talked about. Some of those have standing meetings. Some of those have docs or GitHub project boards that you can look at and kind of see what's going on and uh, find individual people who are owning things to reach out to. 
Uh, we're very friendly. <laughs> we have lots of work to do. And so if you have questions or would like to help, we are happy to hear from you. Yeah, and you don't really need to be a, like a big shot, hot shot you know, coder or anything like that. You, know, yeah. you have some time, come hang out with us. Mm -hmm. Listen to what we are talking. Get some kind of the history and the context. And we'll always be happy to talk to you and give you, you know, additional information on what we know already. Uh, and we'll point you to uh, existing issues, existing caps, uh, existing PRs, and give, we'll give you the history and the context of why things were done. And we are, we are always on Slack, and you can just ping us on Slack. That, that would be a really uh, easy thing uh, for you all to do. And you know, we'll, we can keep it async as well, so drop, drop something in the mailing list. If you don't understand something, you know, please ask so we can get, uh, get you all started. Yep. Is that it? That's it. Thank you. So.